Welcome everybody. I'm Catherine Ident. I'm the senior producer for news and the morning edition host at WCAI, the NPR station for the Cape, the coast and the islands. And we are a sister station to WGBH. Thank you for taking part in tuning in to this month's Beyond the Page Book Club. Today, I'm joined by Maya Shambhag Lang, author of this month's book choice, What We Carry, a Memoir. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with us on this event. Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing, and you can visit them in-store from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week, or you can find more on the website any time of day or night. Before we get started, I would just like to briefly explain how this will work. I know some of you might be new to Zoom, and those of us who use it all the time, I feel like we are always learning something new. So as an attendee, you will not be on video, and you won't be able to speak, but we do want to hear from you. So please ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your question there. You can put a question in at any point during the discussion. And we also encourage you to just ask anything that's on your mind related to this book, whether it's Maya's writing style, the structure of the memoir, how she prepared to write it, or the content of what she writes about itself. So, if you see a question that you want to hear an answer to, if you don't have one of your own, you can vote for it. And if you click a thumbs up, that moves it up the chain and makes it easier for us to be able to get to Maya so that she can answer. We'll also be utilizing the poll feature throughout the event, and we'll be asking you questions as well. So we're going to try a test poll right now. You should see a, a pop up right now in the center of your screen. You should be able to move that window. If you don't want to answer it, you can close it. Or of course, we would love to have you answer the question. And when you answer the question, the window will go away. So here's our first poll question. Is this your first Beyond the Page Book Club event? Let us know. And now I'd like to introduce the team that's behind tonight's event because it takes a lot of people behind the scenes to get this going. They're going to pull the strings and they'll connect with you, but you won't see or hear them. Jen Grillcreast is our event producer and she's controlling what you're seeing on the back end. Jen, say hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's event. I'm so excited to be here and to be able to hear the conversation with Maya. Uh, and thank you so much for all of you that choose to be a part of our Facebook group and uh, participate in all of the discussion questions leading up to tonight's event. So I can't wait for this discussion to get started. And Suzanne's going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A so that we can see those questions and get them to Maya. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining in with us tonight. When you're submitting your questions, definitely let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. And Sarah will let you know a little bit later how you can continue to support the efforts of WGBH in providing these virtual events. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I'm so excited to discuss this book and I'll be back on a little bit to talk about how you can support WGBH and next month's book selection. Thank you. As I mentioned, we will take your questions and that's the, via the Q&A function. So feel free, I'm already seeing things kick in. So that's awesome. That's great, Dallas, Texas, Devons, Massachusetts. Thank you so much. Keep them coming. We're gonna have a lot to talk about. This hour is gonna fly by. And make sure you stick around to the end because we're going to announce some information about next month, the August Beyond the Page. And now for the reason you're here, our author of the evening, it is my pleasure to introduce Maya Shambhag Lang. Maya is the author of What We Carry, which was named a New York Times Editor's Choice book and an Amazon Best Book of 2020. She's also the author of The 16th of June, which was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and finalist for the Audi Audio Award for Best Audiobook. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, In Style, and nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She holds a PhD in comparative literature, and she is the daughter of Indian immigrants. Maya, thank you so much for joining us. It is really great to have you here tonight. Uh, it is absolutely my pleasure. I have lived in Boston for a few years, so it is kind of a second home to me. I have a lot of love for Boston, so this is a real honor to do. We are glad to have you. Maya, we thought we would start off the evening 
with a selection from the memoir, What We Carry. Um, would you care to read something? That would be great. I would love to, and I'm gonna read something that's very short so that we can get to our discussion faster. Awesome. This is an excerpt um, after my mother has been living with me for a few months. As my mother and I drop our pretenses, I find that I can ask her anything. If your plan all along was to go back to India, why did you tell me that you came to the States to give your kids opportunities? I ask. Oh, I did not want to tell you it was an accident, she replies bashfully. I voice all the nagging questions I had as a kid. One day it occurs to me to ask the biggest question of all. Mom, how did you know that you wanted to be a psychiatrist? I didn't, she answers right away. I always wanted to be an OBGYN. She explains that she suffered from postural hypotension, meaning she couldn't stand for long periods of time, which meant it was a deal breaker for performing C-sections. With her dream job ruled out, she settled for psychiatry. That way I could sit in a chair, she says. For the next several days, I'm in a state of shock. A neighbor could confess to committing murder, and all I would think about was my mom's desire to be an obstetrician. Psychiatry did not appeal to me at all, she admits. So many problems. Listening to people can be very boring, you know. It is the last straw, the final puzzle piece that makes me realize how much I deluded myself where she was concerned. The crux of her identity was an accident. She became a psychiatrist out of a desire to be seated. She hadn't planned for me all along. Her trajectory in life was no straight line. I wonder sometimes why I didn't go back to India, she remarks. Staying in this country, it just happened. What a surprise this would have been to hear as a girl, to know that my mother was someone to whom things happened, that this was permissible. She wanted to give me the illusion, though, that she had known what she was doing. I let her. This is not to say that those illusions were meaningless. My mom's stories may have been riddled with untruths, plagued by a suspicious lack of detail, but they defined her. They weren't necessarily true to events, but they were true to her. As a writer, I should have known. A story needn't be accurate in order to be true. Now that the illusions have been stripped away, I miss my mythic mom. I suspect she misses her too. I've been taking care of her physical needs, but who has she become under my care? She has lost her stature. She is stronger, able to take the stairs without help, able to go on long walks, but she lacks her former haughtiness. Maybe it doesn't matter whether our stories are true or false. What matters is that they are ours. And it's such a powerful passage because, you know, having read the book myself, I was so surprised reading along and following along with this story to hear this, right? Because you describe her as such a decisive person. Talk a little bit more about why you chose this selection for this evening. Yeah, so decisive is exactly the right word for her. She was such a scientific, sort of black and white, blunt person. And the last thing you would think was that she was her own fiction writer. Um, and what I really learned living with her is that we are all writers, we are all storytellers. And we all spin these narratives and myths of ourselves and one another, especially in a family. I mean, I really think a family is kind of a battleground for storytelling. And that can actually be the freedom, you know, when you go to college or whenever it is in your life that you leave your family, you get to tell your story differently. Um, and I think what happened in Alzheimer's with my mother is that her armor fell away and her myths fell away. So this anecdote for me really illustrates that kind of spinning of illusions and narratives that we do. And sometimes it's the people who seem so stern and matter of fact, who do the most storytelling, um, 
Whereas I think someone like me who's a fiction writer, often I'm weirdly you know, sort of guileless in the world of um, that sort of myth-making. Yeah, you know, I, the, the whole idea of how you kind of unpack the complexity of the story throughout this book, throughout this story, right? I mean, you, you talked just a little bit now about the stories that your mother kind of told and needed to tell. Um, and you, but you also write about the powerful story that you had in your own head about who your mother was and, and what it does in setting up expectations. You know, some of what I sometimes call the should be's, I should be doing this, I should, right? And sometimes we all get stuck in that kind of cycle where we think we should be doing something rather than kind of listening to ourselves or intuiting or taking a step back. Um, and I, I feel like you really kind of struggled with that and you write about that. That's exactly right. I mean, it's interesting. My mother was always very comfortable talking about certain facets of her life. Um, so for example, she would with ease talk about medical school or talk about her career. And those parts of my life I never personally, you know, I had a great deal of sort of confidence and intuitive belief in myself because she had provided that. Um, so, you know, when she told me about pulling all nighters during her residency or, um, you know, cramming before a test, when it was my turn to do those things, I thought, oh, I know how to do this. The one subject that she was always very sort of quiet about was motherhood. And her standard line, when I would say, when I became a new mom and I started asking her questions and I said, mom, how did you do this? She would always say, oh, I don't know. I just did. Mm. And I think it's the stories that our parents deliver to us, but also the ones that they withhold. You know, the latter I think can really impact us because we fill in the blanks. So my takeaway from her tagline was that she was just uber competent and a super mom and that all of these things that I was struggling with were just a complete non-issue to her. So I read into her evasiveness in a way that um, was a disservice to me and you know the end result was that I put a lot of pressure on myself to make the early days of motherhood, um, I thought that they should be easy because no one had ever told me otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, when you're in your own head like that, you can create with, when you have these big omissions or these big blank spots, we struggle to, to find order. And so we do, we make up these reasons to help us kind of push forward or make sense of something if we don't have all the pieces. We already have some questions coming in. Um, and one is from Maureen and she says she loved the book and that she had a similar journey with her own mother. But she's curious as to how you wrote this book because it appears contemporaneous with events. So is that how it happened? And she's curious because some of her own revelations came to her after the event, sometimes a long time after. Yeah, so I will say it's interesting. I never actually set out to write a memoir, Maureen, you were completely correct that um, I wrote this while I was living it. So it was written in real time. Part of why the chapters are so short is because I didn't have the bandwidth at the time to write long narrative passages because I was so overwhelmed. But anyway, what happened was that, you know, I was in the middle of working on my second novel when my mother, um, when her symptoms became much worse and she came home to live with me. And as a coping mechanism, I started writing Facebook posts to document our time together, but also just to kind of let steam out of the pressure cooker that had become my life. And um, an editor happened to see those posts and contacted my agent and said, I think there's a memoir here. And I said, I'm a fiction writer, I'm flattered, but there's no way I could ever write a memoir. And that same night, I wrote, I think, 70 pages. Wow. And thought, oh, that editor might be onto something. <laughs> um, and it turned out that, yes, I had all of this material that I was grappling with in my mind that I needed to process. 
And if that opportunity hadn't come along, then yes, I think I, I wouldn't have been, you know, processing it in real time the way I ended up doing. Mm -hmm. So that really was a gift because I saw my time differently with my mother because I was writing this book. Sure, I imagine it, it kind of hones your, uh, your observer sense in something that's so emotional. I mean, and you're living it. So it is, uh, you know, a separate skill set to be able to step outside and derive meaning from something that, you know, that you can give out in, in book form to other people. And at the beginning of this, we, we had a few questions from folks who wanted to know how your mom is doing right now. Oh, thank you. Um, she is okay. She's in an assisted living facility, the one that I mention in the book. Um, so as you can imagine, the past few months have been a challenge because I haven't been able to see her. On the other hand, in the way that ignorance is bliss, she has no knowledge of the pandemic. Um, so when I talk to her, you know, I talk to her every day, often multiple times a day, because she'll call me. And um, the, you know, if anything, she registers that like maybe there's like a cold going around. Um, but uh, yeah, so she is blissfully unaware mm -hmm. of um, the pandemic, and she um, has her symptoms have. Uh, worsened since I wrote this book, but she still remembers me and uh, we're able to still have conversations. That's, that is a precious and important thing. And so does that mean, does she know about the book being out? Most of the time when she calls me, you know, our relationship has definitely fully done a 180 where I'm now the mother and she's sort of the child. So when she calls me, it's because she needs something or wants something. Um, so most of our conversations are like that. It doesn't really occur to her to ask me about my life the same way that like young children don't ask us about our work day. Um, she did once ask uh, if I was writing something new and I mentioned the book and I showed her the cover and she had this pause and she said, wait, is that supposed to be me and you on the cover? That's actually not a photograph of me and my mother. Um, so it's not us, but it, you know, it could be. And yeah. she, said, she said, is that supposed to be us? And I said, yeah. And, and she had this long moment and then she said, wow. <laughs> so she was definitely, you know, at least in that moment, quite moved by it. Mm. Um, the other thing I'll say, by the way, about writing this book in real time that um, for people who have read the whole book, if I'm allowed to go there, I think they safely can. I think um, the majority of the people who took the poll have read the book. There are a few in the crowd who'd rather not hear spoilers, but I think the majority of people are okay. This won't really, I think, give anything away, but I'll say this just as an interesting point about writing a memoir. My major question was, I didn't know how I was going to end the book. Um, because when you're writing about your own life, you kind of think, okay, how do I land this plane? <laughs> so at a certain point in the writing process, I had remembered the story of the woman in the river that my mother had told me. And I decided to make that a, you know, kind of continuing thread throughout the whole book. And so it dawned on me one afternoon, I thought, oh, I could take her for a walk and ask her about that story again and see what she has to say, which I did. And that's how that last iteration of the story, that's how that came out, was I literally was like, okay, I need a way to end this book. Why don't I ask her about this myth that she told me? So I went on this walk and asked her and I was flabbergasted by what she said. People who have read the whole book will know what I'm talking about. And I couldn't, as a fiction writer, I couldn't have dreamed up what she told me. And I got us back home as quickly as I could in order to capture exactly how that scene had transpired. So that particular scene was written within an hour of it actually happening. Wow. That's unbelievable. And there's some synchronicity there 
because that story, that parable is woven throughout the book. And, you know, I, I finished the book a few days ago, but that the imagery and that the, the meaning of that story and the uncertainty of what that woman is doing really, really just keeps, I keep thinking about it. I keep, I keep mulling it over. It's, it's powerful. And, and there are kind of multiple ways to look at it as you kind of demonstrate in the, in the book. Yeah, there are multiple ways of looking at it. And part of what I reflect on, I mean, to Maureen's point about how you continue to look back um, you know, I've continued to look back since writing this book. It's been a few years and my life has changed quite a bit. So I've continued to reflect on my time with my mother. And one thing I think about now with quite a bit of just compassion for her is how she told the story the first time and what that says about how guilty she felt about her choices. You know, that she could only talk about, even though it was a parable, she wasn't talking about her own life, but even within that fictional construct, she couldn't let the woman let go. She had to chop off the ending um, because she felt so, uh, she had such a heavy conscience about her own choices. And I think she couldn't even touch them, um, even with narrative distance and even through fiction. Um, so I, I think about that quite a bit about how much guilt she carried um, unnecessarily, because I think, especially as a girl, if she had just told me the truth from the get-go, um, I never would have read into it. My brother certainly didn't mind how he, you know, his upbringing. Um, Which is a huge revelation in the book. Yes. And for you, of course. You know. Yes. And it's interesting how we modify our stories as parents based on what our own sensitivities are. You know, she had no qualms telling me about like multiple all-nighters that she'd pulled in med school, but I could see a different parent not wanting to share that and being like, oh, maybe that'll like set my kid up for bad habits or something. So we all have our own choices that we make in what we tell our kids and we don't realize how those stories will affect their choices. Yeah, and we also don't really have a ton of control over that, right? I mean, we're just by the virtue of being alive and having a full life, we we are going to have omissions in the, in the things that we tell our loved ones, whether they're children or other adults in our life. And so, in a sense, you kind of have to put out what you feel is best, which I'm sure, I mean, I felt like your mother did, at least that's how I interpreted it. You know, she... You know, and it, it's just, it just shows you that there's a strong role for a listener in the story as well, because even though you might feel passive as you hear a story, you really are active. Yes. Your own life and assumption. Absolutely. And um, so much of this is also cultural, right? Like when I look at my relationship with my daughter, Zoe, I know already that um, she feels very comfortable just asking me questions and calling me out on things, or she'll point out inconsistencies. You know, she'll say, mom, didn't that actually happen this way? And I'll be like, oh, right. You're totally right about that. So we have a very open, different relationship just by virtue of, you know, both being American, frankly. Um, and with my mother who, um, you know, loved me a great deal, but there were so many walls that were up just as a function of having been born and you know in India and having grown up there, one of the things I mention in the book is that Indian women aren't even supposed to say their husbands' first names out loud in traditional Hindu Brahmin households. You never say so. If you can imagine that, I mean, it's sort of like if you can't even say a person's name, it feels like there's so much that's off limits for discussion. Mm. Absolutely. I know we've been talking for a few minutes, but if anyone has come on late to this, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are talking with Maya Shambhag Lang, author of the memoir, What We Carry. And we have some more questions, lots of questions. We hope to get to as many of them as we can, but if you'd like to ask one or vote on one, open up your Q&A tab and that's where you can get a question or vote on a question that you think is important. And then one question that a lot of people seem to want to get answered is about your brother, Maya. And it's whether you 
harbor any resentment toward him in regard to how the caregiving happened and also what he thought about the book. Yeah, so another gift of writing this book, you know, it's funny, I was so scared when I started writing it, but one real gift of the experience is that my brother and I became much closer. I sent him an early draft of it and I said to him, listen, ultimately my relationship with you matters to me more than this book. So I want you to tell me if you object to anything. And he called me a couple of weeks later in this horrified voice. And he said, oh my God, I come across as like a jerk. <laughs> and I said, no, you don't at all. I think he saw himself very differently after reading this. And I think at the time he had felt overwhelmed and he hadn't really thought about his own choices and what that meant for me. But the main thing was that we had never, ever talked about our father. And he never knew that our father had been cruel to me. And I never really knew that, you know, I just made assumptions that my brother was the prized firstborn son, golden child, and that, um, he could do no wrong in our parents' eyes, but, and my brother had made sort of the same assumption about me as the daughter. And it turned out, yeah, that um, our father had been terrible to him and we were able to connect over that. And I think both feel validated and like we weren't alone in what we had experienced as children. So that was incredible. Um, another gift, really. Another gift, absolutely. Yeah. And, and harkens back to the idea that, again, we have our stories in our head that we cultivate or that we've heard from others. And sometimes it takes a new story or a new perspective to help us see into a, a situation that we thought we kind of had all boxed up and, and we had a good grip on that. That's right. And this idea that two siblings could grow up in the same house and not know certain things about one another you know, I think in a novel, I would have real trouble getting away with it because I would think, well, how is that possible? You know, how could she not know that about him or how could they never talk about their father? But that's how real life actually unfolds. And there's so much that we don't speak about and just, you know, kind of shove it into a corner and try not to think about Mm -hmm. Especially because life moves fast and it's full and sometimes we don't have the opportunity to step back and, and look at the nuance and say, well, wait a minute, there's something more here. Uh, another popular question is about another person in the book and that is your husband Noah. He had a small role in the book. And so Merle asks, how is Noah's relationship to his wife, daughter, and mother-in-law? So. Um, as I've done author events, I never know what the audience knows and what the audience doesn't because I've written essays, personal essays about my life since the memoir and what has transpired. So um, I'm actually no longer married to Noah, um, but this is not a bad thing. We have an excellent relationship as co-parents, so it's not some sort of horrible, tragic thing. We're both much happier. Um, but it's interesting, a couple of people who have read the book, not knowing that that was the outcome, have observed that. So I think um, it's an astute reader who picks up on his role in the book. So part of what happened to me in the writing of this, and of course, when you go to write a memoir, you can't control what comes out or what you might start thinking about. My editor at some point had said to me, you never talk about Noah. Like you describe him in passing as this wonderfully supportive husband, but you never actually, like, can we see scenes of that? And it started to dawn on me that in the same way I really wanted to have a fantastic mother because I'd won such, um, you know, like such a horrible parent in my father. So I sort of needed my mother to be amazing. So I created this whole mythology around her. I think in a similar way, I desperately wanted to have a caring, devoted, wonderful spouse. And because of the way that I grew up, I sort of thought, if you're married to someone who doesn't yell and doesn't have a temper, 
that's fantastic. That's great. That's supportive. That's amazing. Um, and only after writing the memoir did it start to dawn on me that, oh, that's actually not partnership. Um, but yeah, we are um, wonderful co-parents and Zoe is doing well and happily goes back and forth between our households. Um, so yeah. It shows you the power of memoir, not just for the reader who takes it in, but in the process of writing that self-discovery that you can really peel back the layers when you sit down to try to distill life and all of its complications and all of its points and jagged edges and, and beautiful parts as well. Um, I want to take a quick break because I want to hear from Sarah for just a moment on how you can help to support events like this with WGBH, not just beyond the page, but all the virtual events that WGBH provides. And don't forget, we do want to keep hearing from you. There's, there's lots of wonderful questions, so keep them coming. But first, let's, let's hear from Sarah. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight for our Beyond the Page book club. Uh, the great thing about books and WGBH is the fact that both are commercial free. The advantage of being commercial free is that we have more time to give you the human element. We can take the time to uncover an extra angle on a person or an event. More time lets us do more stories and more kinds of stories so that you are better informed. Our commercial free status also means we can count on your support. If you're able to give at $5 a month as a WGBH sustainer, you will receive an autographed copy of next month's book, uh, which is Fast Girls as a token of our appreciation. As we navigate this ever-changing reality, financial support from our donors keeps us going. And please help strengthen us today. Give for $5 a month or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. It's so easy. So please go to wgbh.org slash support events and please click on the link and contribute what you can. Uh, happy reading and thanks for listening and supporting WGBH. Back to you, Catherine. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. And so Maya, in thinking about some of the, the things that you, and the anecdotes that you've been talking about this evening, like specifically with your brother and how you each kind of had your own way of looking into your, your family story, um, it made me think a little bit about the title of the memoir. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so actually that's a funny story. Um, the original title of this book was The Woman in the River, which you know, as I mentioned, when I was working on the first draft of this book, I stumbled, you know, I stumbled upon that memory of, oh, right, my mother had told me this story, I made this decision to make it um, the sort of dominant motif of the book and to have it come back. So that seemed like a natural title. And my editor was happy with it, my agent was happy with it, and Random House rejected it for very good reasons. At the time, there were a slew of books that came out with a very similar formula, um, where it was basically the feminine figure preposition place. So it was like the girl on the train, the woman in the window, the woman in the cabin, there were like a bunch of them. And so we thought, oh no, you know, they rightly pointed out that first of all, the book might get lost in that shuffle. And secondly, that people might mistake it for a mystery or suspense novel. So they passed the baton back to me and said, why don't you brainstorm, which I did. And my editor and I talked about it and came up with what we carry, partly to evoke all the stuff that people walk around with in our minds and our hearts and all of the, you know, the kind of baggage that we carry, but also because another thread in the book is my relationship with weightlifting. And so we wanted something that hit on that. So we ended up feeling like what we carry actually was more of an open title and um, had room for more connotations and uh, possibility than the woman in the river. Yeah, and you know, mentioning the weightlifting, of, now that you say it, of course, um, to me, going into the book and then thinking about the motifs and the themes of the book, what we carry made sense to me as a reader. I was, you know, 
on board with it, but the weightlifting part, you know, I wanted to ask you about self-care, right? Self-care is kind of a buzzword right now, but do you really kind of pick apart that meaning and, and, and really kind of define it for yourself? And it's not necessarily a spa trip. It's something bigger and, and really about breathing or surviving, right? Yes. And I think, so I have so much to say about this topic because especially for women, I think two things. I think first, in America in particular, we tend to view self-care through this very capitalistic sort of lens where we think self-care means a massage or a pedicure or a glass of wine. Um, it's all things to be purchased, you know, objects or services, um, indulgences. And what I actually think self-care is about is self-prioritizing and finding the things that feed you. One of the things I've thought about is, you know, on the, um, if you go on an airplane, which now seems like such an abstract thought, <laughs> but back in the day when we used to do that, on the in-flight video, they talk to you about putting on your oxygen mask first in the event of an emergency. And I think, first of all, that for women, especially for mothers, it's so incredibly hard to actually do that. Like we watch that in-flight video and we say, oh, of course, but in the moment, would you actually be able to put your own oxygen mask on first when you have children? I think that's a real challenge. And then secondly, I think to give yourself oxygen first, not just in the event of an emergency, but to do that every day as a choice should not be this radical act, but it feels that way. And if you think about it, oxygen is air. It is not some luxury. It is something that we should be giving ourselves daily, hourly, you know, moment by moment. We should be feeding ourselves so that we can give the people around us more of ourselves, yes, but also because we deserve air and because we should breathe freely. So yeah, I mean, my two sort of lifelines, my oxygen mask, you know, consists of um, writing and weightlifting. And the latter is not something I ever saw for myself. But once I began doing it, it immediately felt like, oh, this is me. And this is who I'm meant to be. And it's a place where I can be intense, and strong and take up space unapologetically and own that part of myself in a way that is incredibly liberating. Mm. Yeah, and push yourself too, right? You take risks. You write about wanting to do pull-ups and thinking, I can't do that. And, and then this transformation to doing that and a, a whole lot more. In the yeah, so I went from, being not in shape at all, you know, where I, not only could I not do a pull-up, I couldn't believe that I would ever do a pull-up to then hitting a point where I was doing pull-ups with weight attached to me. So I can now do pull-ups with like, you know, weights chained to my body. I squat 400 pounds. Um, I deadlift more than the men at the gym, um, over 300 pounds. And, um, I love that. I love tapping into that part of myself. And I think for me, at least, I was taught growing up, especially by my father, to take up as little space as possible and to be small and cooperative and not cause trouble. And so to march onto the gym floor and rack up weight and just own that, it really feels like a kind of reckoning and an act of self-acceptance and a way of saying this part of me is not just okay, but it's to be celebrated and to be honored. And it struck me too as real self-love because you had, and you write about how you had needed help. We all need help and you needed help at various points in your life and felt you didn't get it from your mother or you didn't get it from other points in your life that you needed it from and you were able 
you were stronger than you thought just walking in that gym door because you already had that deep reserve of strength to say, I need help and I am the help. And I, yeah. I found that powerful. That's such a beautiful way of putting it. I think that's true for all of us, that we are all so strong. We all have these reserves that we don't even know about. Um, I think a lot of us have been finding that during this period, right? That who knew, my God, who knew that this would ever happen? And there are the challenges that we seek out in life. And then there are those that are foisted upon us, whether it's illness, you know, a, a loved one suffering, um, a global pandemic, and these sorts of challenges that we never would have chosen and that get thrust upon us, those are the ones that really cause us to grow and evolve and that show us what we're made of. One thing I think a lot about, I mentioned this in the book, is that like a, a coal, a piece of coal would never choose to become a diamond because it is not comfortable. Like when you are in that long juncture of pressure and time, that's not a happy place to be, but you don't get to the other side of strength and brilliance and clarity without going through that. Hmm. Yeah, without the pressure to test, test your strength. Yeah, test your strength. Kind of along the lines of, 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 of needing help and seeking help, um, an anonymous person, but the, uh, it seems that um, a few of the other attendees tonight would like this question to be answered writes that um, it's been about a month since this, since this person has read the book, but wants to know more about what you wrote about by seeing the psychologist, because you kind of, I guess, write that you're quite opinionated about your mother and you, your anger about her not visiting you, right? When we were talking about asking for help when you were really struggling with postpartum depression. And this person writes, I felt like he exacerbated your anger and took a side in a way that as a psychologist myself, I found unusual. What are your thoughts to that? As a psychologist himself, he found? I, I, he found that, un, or the person found that unusual. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember at the time, my therapist, and especially as a daughter of a psychiatrist, I'm a huge believer in therapy. Um, and a huge proponent of it. I think in an ideal world, we would have, you know, every single person would have access to therapy. Um, but anyway, he at the time, um, I think it didn't push me towards anger. It's more that he picked up on the fact before I saw it, he saw how much I had put my mother on a pedestal and the fact that that position hadn't necessarily been earned. So there are things I talk about in the book that in hindsight, especially now as a parent myself, um, my daughter is now 11, I'm in disbelief that my mother did certain things, you know, where it's like, okay, if my God Zoe happened to go through that, um, my reaction would be so different where I would wanna provide so many resources for her, I'd wanna be there for her. So yeah, part of what I talk about in the book, it's not just the fact that my mother wasn't there for me when I had severe postpartum depression and became suicidal, but also when I was an adolescent um, and attempted to take my life, her response to that was to just, you know, in like a 30 second conversation say, let's not do that again, okay? And that was it. And we never made reference to it again. Um, and at the time. I mean, for most of my life, I took that to be this like fantastically strategic and brilliant choice on her part that she was trying to, you know, I had all kinds of ways of justifying it. And I really performed this sort of daughterly act of mental gymnastics to justify her choices. You know, I contorted logic in all, all sorts of ways to say these were such great choices on her part. And my shrink, um, he had plenty of brilliant moments, but I think in this case, that was just sort of like a Captain Obvious moment of, wait a minute, maybe we want to unpack that a little bit, or maybe we want to 
interrogate that just a tiny bit. And what's interesting to me in hindsight is how defensive I felt on her behalf and how I was not ready to take away her trophy as being the best mom on the planet. Right, and it harkens back to the, the theme of, of the stories we tell ourselves or the story who we want to believe. And then also being the listener too and, and listening and taking it in and then constructing your own vision of her. I mean, you are your own separate person. She had her own self view and, and way she thought she was projecting outward. And, you know, you don't even know if she had any idea that you thought of her that way in, in, in a way. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think one thing about stories is that we carry them around with us because they serve certain goals. And we open up that suitcase when we're ready to, but until we're ready, that suitcase stays closed. And when we do open it, you know, it's not that the suitcase is ever empty. We're always putting new stories in it. And when we unpack those old stories, uh, we unpack them in certain ways that later, you know, so we're, we're always repeating this process of absorbing and listening and reprocessing. That I think never ends. Mm -hmm. Wendy asks if you ever reconnected with that therapist to let him know that you have kind of come to these realizations about your relationship. I did. I wrote him an email update at a certain point um, and told him how much he had, you know, helped me. And especially he had, I think, planted certain seeds that later I was able to think about and take up. So I did want to let him know that um, his insights had led me to really helpful places. So, yes. Um, yeah, one of the wonderful parts about writing a memoir is that you're able to take stock of different people, you know, situations, people who have helped you and reach out to them, reconnect with them. Yeah, that's a lovely thing. That's a really lovely thing. We have another question from someone who doesn't wish to be named, but asks, does your father know about your mother's illness? And do you still not have a relationship with him or have you found a way to reconnect? I do not have a relationship with him. I think, I know it must be um, for some people difficult to think about a child not having a relationship with a parent. For me personally, it was the best decision I ever made. And truthfully, the minute I released him from my life and gave myself permission to not pick up the phone. Not that he called that often, you know, he would call once in a blue moon. Um, but just his sort of hovering presence in my life and the fact that I had that door open, it caused me such anxiety. And the minute that I let myself off the hook and thought, oh, I don't have to play that role. I don't have to be the cooperative daughter. Um, it was so incredibly uh, freeing. And I think it's no accident that in the book, the same point in my life where I tell him he's not allowed to visit with his, you know, like 30 day fiance, <laughs> um, that's the same point that I start writing my first novel. Mm. Really? And I think that the that side of me, the writer side of me, had always been in hiding. And because his voice was in my head telling me, you're not allowed to pursue certain things, you're not allowed to be a certain way. And deciding to tune him out and think in more healthful ways about my life, that enabled me to, to be the actual person that I am inside. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he, um, for the past 12 years, I didn't hear a word from him. And he would occasionally like tell various people in my family that he had tried to reach out to me, but, um, and it was untrue. Um, and then when the memoir came out, he put together this very bizarre, I don't even know how to describe it, but like a kind of 
slideshow of sorts that he, I think, wanted to sort of rewrite um, my childhood. And it was this in fascinating but really bizarre, you know, glimpse into how his mind works. It was like a rewriting of my childhood. Um, so, yeah, so we still do not have a relationship and, um, yeah. Thank you for answering that question. Debbie thanks you, of course, for being here with us tonight. And she's thinking about the thread between your mother, you, and your daughter now. Has your daughter read the book, she asks? How okay. has, how, and she wants to know too, like, how has writing the book impacted your relationship with Zoe? Yeah, so Zoe is only 11 years old, so she has not read the book. Um, and it's interesting, sometimes people will ask me like, oh, when do you think she will read it? Or do you have a plan for this? I don't have a plan. I think it's something that's going to just organically unfold. And um, she, Zoe does know that the book is dedicated to her and to my mother, and she likes that. Um, and definitely writing this book made me think a lot about motherhood and how I want to be as a mother, it made me realize that I think it's far more important, um, you know, instead of what we say to our children, we can lecture them and tell them the best stories, but it's the actual choices we make that impact them so much more. And, you know, when I separated from my husband, I'd been so racked with fear and guilt. And one of the things that stunned me was that the minute she saw me be happier, she sort of became this freer being. So it's incredible what kids absorb. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I always try and think about is that because of Zoe, I, because I'm so aware of making choices that are healthful choices and that prioritize me because I want to model that for her. Ultimately, I think the best decisions I've made in my life have been not despite Zoe, but because of her and because she is kind of my North Star who's always orienting me towards the positive. Um, and because I would never want her to martyr herself, that helps me not martyr myself. Mm. And you write beautifully about how having a child like that can really help you reorient your whole world. The land shifts in such a, a you know, magnificent and just huge way. Um, and you recalibrate as you write about how you think about yourself and, and the should be's of being a mother versus the realities of being a human, a woman, or a writer, or you know, a weightlifter and a mom, right? All these things at once, then you want her to grow up and live as fully as she can. It, already, we are almost at the end of the hour and there are a few more questions. So I'm gonna just get them out to you because there's a lot of people who wanna hear. And so this is about Alzheimer's and caring for a parent. Do you have any advice for someone who is considering caring for a parent who is ailing? Oh my gosh. Uh, first of all, I would say that even though that time with my mother was incredibly fraught and difficult, it also meant so much to me and I would not trade it for anything. I mean, I'm so grateful to have had that time with her. And as I say in the book, the incredibly hard thing about Alzheimer's is that drags your loved one away from you. I talk about the apostrophe in the name and how that's the sort of hook. It's this possessive hook where it feels like the person is no longer yours and suddenly belongs to the illness. So I think to have time with the person is a way of um, just preserving 
and sort of reclaiming what Alzheimer's is taking from you. And because you know that that time is precious, you look at it differently and you experience it differently. So I'm deeply grateful for that time that we had together. And the one thing I would say is that because in my case, I didn't give it thought. It happened so, you know, it was on the fly. In hindsight, if I had known that was going to be my setup, I absolutely would have had conversations, not only with my brother, but also just with other people because the caregiver needs as much support as possible and needs to be supported in the same way that the recipient of care needs to be supported. Um, and the hardest thing is what I inadvertently ended up doing, which is to be the woman in the river, you know, to be the solitary figure up to your chin in rising waters. And that can be alienating and isolating and can lead to caregiver burnout. So give yourself not just one life raft, but a dozen life vests and canoes in the water and as much support as you can. Yeah, the helpers need the help. The helpers need the help. That's right. And I think also to give yourself outlets as much as possible, whether that's breaks um, and, um, you know, also things like therapy or writing, journaling, belonging to a support group so that you can, even if it's online, to talk to other people um, who are going through similar things. One of the tough parts for me was that I would try and do that, but I was, God, I think 34 when I was first you know, really dealing with, when I first started dealing with my mom, I was like 30, but um, so I would go on these online support groups and feel very different from people who had grown children um, who were dealing with parents with Alzheimer's. Mm. Yeah, and it reminds me too of how you defined for yourself self-care and, and when you're in a situ situation like this where you're caring for someone else who it's it's so complicated that self-care piece yeah critical yes and as a side note i also think for people right now during the pandemic that is also incredibly crucial to especially when i hear from women you know married women who have children and who are sort of tending to everyone and being everyone's emotional support and doing all of the physical child care and all of that it's very easy to feel stretched too thin oh yeah Absolutely, especially in something like this that can feel never ending. Uh, another anonymous attendee wants to know if you're in the process of writing anything new. Uh, yes, so I'm at this interesting juncture in my career where I don't know if my next book will be fiction or memoir. And I have that novel that was on the back burner from when I you know, was caring for my mother and that got interrupted. So I have that. And then I also have, um, since this memoir came out, I've written some essays and it's such a different experience. In fiction, you create this whole parallel universe and you set up all these characters in order to talk about things that are on your mind versus in personal writing, you just get to talk about the stuff directly. And there are pros to that because you can access it just immediately and you know when you've reached a place of truth and vulnerability because you feel it in your own body. You, you know, you get kind of uncomfortable. You think like, oh, that's like hitting a nerve in me. Versus in fiction, it's all kind of a playground. So it's a little bit more removed. I think it's the difference between like hearing the human heart through a stethoscope that's fiction. And memoir is like open heart surgery where you're like holding the heart in your hands. So it's messier, but also more powerful, I think. Oh, what a great visual of, of <laughs> thinking about the two different genres. And one last question, because we are at eight o'clock. What is the hardest part about memoir versus fiction? I mean, you mentioned that you can get straight, you can get to the truth to it, so much faster in your mind in memoir, but what's one of the biggest challenges? Yeah, so I'll tell you a kind of 
odd, quirky um, story behind the scenes of the writing of this memoir, which is that I have that scene early in the book. It's that memory with my father where he sends me to the driveway when I'm seven years old and he makes me stand barefoot on the hot blacktop. So my editor had asked me for a scene with my father. I had been describing him in the memoir just in passing as a difficult person or as a controlling person. And she said, no, we need an actual scene. And I couldn't write a scene. Anytime I tried to, I got, something came over me where I felt scared and blocked. And I would break out into hives because I was so physically uncomfortable with the thought of writing about him. And one day I noticed, but I didn't want to let my editor down, right? So I thought, okay, I'm really going to try and do this. And I noticed that the hives were all concentrated around my feet. And I thought, God, that's so weird. It's like my feet are trying to tell me something. Mm. And then this memory flooded back of being seven years old and being made to stand barefoot on that driveway. So I hadn't realized I'd been carrying that memory around with me. So I think this is the gift of memoir, but also to answer the question, the most difficult part of memoir is that it is like building a house using your own body parts. I mean, it is, you're really drawing on yourself in a way that you cannot delimit or control or put safeguards up. You know, it's not, when writing fiction, you might kind of hit on things that, where you think, oh, that's interesting, but you're always removed. And in memoir, you, you just can't, um, you have no control over what comes up and you're implicated in the process of writing the whole time that you're doing it. And that can lead to insights. I'm very glad for everything I've remembered because it's been cathartic and ultimately empowering to face those memories. Um, but during the writing process, it can be you know, quite raw and disconcerting and uncomfortable. Mm a type of therapy in its own way. That's right. Yeah. Maya, thank you so much for spending this time with us tonight and, and answering all of your, these questions and talking about your process and, and remembering the anecdotes in the book itself. It's a beautiful, powerful book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and to everyone for being here. I appreciate all of your questions. Um, Catherine from you and also from the whole audience. So this is really the pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And before we wrap up and talk about what's coming up next, we'd just like to hear from Sarah one more time. Sarah? Thanks, Catherine. Uh, and thanks everyone so much for tuning in tonight to this month's Beyond the Page book club event. It was such a moving and personal conversation and I feel like I could listen to it for another hour or so. Uh, if you, to continue, if you become a sustainer at just $5 a month or one payment of $60, we can thank you today with an autographed copy of next month's Beyond the Page book, which is Fast Girls by Elise Hooper. We have a limited amount of these special autographed copies available, so be sure to visit wgbh.org slash support events to not only show your support for WGBH and the work we do, uh, to make it easy for you, we actually just put the link in the chat. So go ahead and click that now. Uh, thank you so much. And in the coming weeks, of course, we're going to take a dive into Fast Girls, as Sarah just mentioned by Elise Hooper. And Kelly Crossley is going to be leading that discussion. I'm sure it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and that's going to happen on Wednesday, September 16th at 7 o'clock. And you can register for that at wgbh.org slash events. And don't forget to also join the Beyond the Page Facebook group because there's more discussion topics happening there and questions and, and just fun things happening as you read the books as part of this club. We really look forward to connecting with you again and we hope that you and your family are staying healthy physically and emotionally. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>